This was the fight. This was it. Nothing fanciful. The fight. That said it all. It was the essence of one against one. This stoic man from Beaufort, South Carolina, against this handsome, brash, outspoken guy became bigger than life. The greatest sport at the end of the 20th century. Two undefeated heavyweight champions against a backdrop unique in history. This was the Crusades, patriotic America versus radical America. Here's this collision between the black militant and the black tongue. Who's going to win? It was what boxing was meant to be, a real killing ground. It was a fashion show. It was a celebrity walk. Everybody from every aspect of the entertainment and sports industry was there. On March 8, 1971, the eyes of the world were focused on a small square of illuminated canvas. Whatever you did, whoever you were, that night, that's where you wanted to be. Why was this fight so much more about America than it was about boxing? Why could everyone appreciate this confrontation between two undefeated heavyweights? To understand March 8, 1971, you had to know who these fighters were and where they came from. Joe Frazier was as different from Ali as night and day. Ali came from a middle-class Louisville family, had aunts that were teachers. Frazier came from what was then the hunger capital of America, Beaufort, South Carolina. At a very early age, he worked in the fields. He'd arrive in the morning, little after dawn, and he'd say, morning, boss, and the boss would say, to the mule. And then the day would end, and he'd say, quitting time, boss, and the boss would say, in the morning. This was the way the white world and the black world fit together in his Beaufort. So in 1959, 15-year-old Joe Frazier left Beaufort and settled in Philadelphia where he worked days in a slaughterhouse and nights learning to box. The most exciting fighter in Rome this year was Cassius Clay. That was his name then, a 19-year-old Olympic gold medalist who suddenly was the talk of boxing. I was shadow boxing early in the day. I figured I was ready for Cassius Clay. I said, fee, fi, fo, fum, Cassius Clay, here I come. Drew my throat like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Hey! Rumble, young man, rumble. Hey! The most charismatic athlete I've been around, the whole current to his behavior was to amuse and to entertain. And if you like to lose your There were a lot of fools. In their 1964 title bout, Sonny Liston was a 7-to-1 favorite. But the Louisville lip had the last word. And the loudest. We start saying, I'm pretty, I'm the greatest. Things like that we'd never said before. And we say them anywhere, and we started looking at ourselves like we were pretty, and that we were great because of Cassius Clay. But now that he was the champ, he suddenly announced that he was a black Muslim. I charge the white man with being the greatest liar on earth. A group of Negro dissenters is taking to street corner step ladders across the United States to preach a gospel of hate. The nation of Islam, as we know, was dominated primarily by ne'er-do-wells, criminals, ex-prostitutes, drug dealers, pimps, pushers, etc. So to have a guy who didn't have a prison record was a radiant young man of the moment come into that organization with a very big coup. Cassius is not my name no more. Officially Muhammad Ali now. Muhammad Ali, right. Muhammad Ali, that's my name. For Cassius Clay to announce that he was now a member of the Nation of Islam, I think it sent, in many ways, shockwaves through the white establishment. And, of course, the end of the love affair with Cassius Clay, despite his skills as a fighter. Joe Frazier of Philadelphia, six feet one, 196 pounds, a hard hitter. Even with a dislocated thumb, Joe Frazier won the Olympic heavyweight gold medal at Tokyo in 1964, four years after Ali had won his. But when Joe returned to Philadelphia, 
that gold medal did not pay the bills. Joe Frazier came home from the Olympics with a busted thumb and a busted bankroll. He didn't even have a job. It's close to Christmas, and I'm doing a radio show, and I ask the listeners to contribute toys for Joe's kids. People all around the world send gifts, presents, checks, cash, and it really came out to be a good Christmas for the kids. Because his thumb needed surgery, Joe waited nearly a year to make his pro debut in August 1965, a first round knockout of Woody Goss. His payday? Joe kept the money from the tickets he sold to his own fight, about $125. And I remember the guy from the Associated Press asking Joe, did he want to fight the clay next? And uh, Joe said, hey, slow down a little, <laughs> you know. That December, 40 Philadelphia businessmen, black and white, formed Cloverlay Inc. to back Joe's career. He got $100 a week, a percentage of the purse, and financial peace of mind. Well, they put together 80 shares at $250 a share, but nobody thought they were going to get rich on this. Under the tutelage of manager Yank Durham, Frazier's career was building steadily, but not spectacularly. He was undefeated, but went largely unnoticed. At that time, there was only one fighter who got all the attention. I'm the resurrect of the fight game. You are. If it wasn't for me, the whole thing would be dead. I guess that's true. He was the champ, and I was coming along four years behind, and I said, I don't believe that he could whip me. I remember in 1966, Joe and I were at the Concord Hotel, and we were watching TV, and we were watching Muhammad Ali fight Henry Cooper, and, and he's saying, if I had that opportunity to be within the ring, he'd be laying on his back right now. I just want that opportunity, man. But in 1967, the U.S. government's selective service system would beat Joe to the punch. over the communist aggression. Cassius Clay, or as he prefers to be called, Muhammad Ali, reports to an army induction center in Houston, Texas. However, he says he will refuse on religious grounds to take the army oath, an act that could cost him a $10,000 fine or a five-year prison sentence or both. He didn't understand why we were fighting a war thousands of miles away, and what would happen if the communists won, what would it mean? Hello? Are you missing silverware at home? I thought going to war would help my people receive their freedom, justice, and equality. You wouldn't have to draft me. I'll go tomorrow. I remember very vividly that Cassius Clay suddenly became the great enemy of our family. And the comments that were being made around the dinner table were the same comments that were being made around the country. Oh, yeah, he's so big and strong, he'll fight in a ring, but he's afraid to fight in Vietnam. He's a coward. And I respected Cassius as one of the great fighters of all time, but uh, I think this hurts him, certainly in my eyesight. I think it's very bad, especially a guy who had made a lot of money in this country. Joe Lewis went into the United States Army. Why can't Muhammad Ali serve this country that has been so good to him? People growing up today don't have any sense at all of how hated and despised and feared and reviled he was. Do you think there's anything wrong in someone like Cassius Clay refusing induction? Yes, sir, I certainly do. Why? Because he's no better than the rest of us. The government announces it will institute felony charges. Mr. Clay's lawyers say they will appeal, and world boxing organizations announce he has forfeited his heavyweight title. Deferred from the draft because he was married with children, Frazier had not worried much about Vietnam. Uh, Cassius Clay, what's, what's your feeling about that situation? Well, uh, to me, if you like you stepping in politics on me, that's a little out of my line. Uh, I mean, about, about fighting him, how do you think you'd make it? Oh, I would love to fight Clay. Uh -huh. It was a, a big disappointment to me, but therefore I had to go on with my life. But I say to myself that we know the rules and regulations of our land, and if he didn't fulfill it, well, therefore, whatever... The consequence that he had to pay, that was his thing. By refusing to take the symbolic step forward to join the military, Ali triggered a national debate, despised by some, embraced by others. I think Cassius 
Clay took an honorable stand. He refused to be forced to go against his conscience. Do you support him? I support him and everybody like him. Here was this black fighter who refused to go to Vietnam, was willing to give up his career and his livelihood. That was awesome. That was incredibly inspiring. He found that thing that both, both of these groups, the hippie generation and the black nationalist generation, seemed to agree on, which was Vietnam. You could see the country actually dividing over what? Over Price Fighter. With Ali out of the picture, the World Boxing Association announced an eight-man elimination tournament to produce its new champion. But Joe Frazier boycotted that tournament. Joe Frazier! Joe preferred to fight Big Buster Mathis for the nationally respected New York State Athletic Commission title. In view of Fraser's recent clear-cut victory over Mathis, this board now recognized Joe Fraser as the heavyweight champion of the world. For the anti-Ali voices, Joe Fraser was a throwback to another era. Fraser was, was out of the Joe Lewis mold. He was always very obliging, always smiled, and Fraser was no surprise. The other guy was a whole revolution. I'm champion with the people to be recognized here in America and throughout the world, Asia and Africa, he's got to whoop me. Joe Frazier filled in a blank space, which was vacated by Muhammad Ali. And for that reason, uh, most people are still saw in Muhammad Ali the champion of the world. He had a lot of animosity because he had become great, well-known, and everyone kept saying, but you've never fought Muhammad Ali. Not that he didn't want to, but with no boxing commission willing to license Ali for a fight, that was impossible. Ali's exile would last nearly three and a half years. Joe himself felt that that which had happened to Ali was unfair. And he said this to Ali, eyeball to eyeball, whatever it takes for me to lend myself to you in getting licensed again, I'll be there for you. He called, say, well, Hey, man, I want my license. What can we do? I said, I'll see what I can do to help you get the license. Joe even went to Washington to meet informally with boxing officials to support the licensing of Ali. They would just have good, respectful conversations with one another. Yeah, Joe, we're going to get it on, you know what I mean? We're going we gonna to break all box, box office records, you know what I'm saying? But all those box office records were still in Ali's dreams. He was broke. He was almost forced to ask you for $100 so he could do an interview, which he never would have done before or did do afterwards. To stay afloat financially, Ali lectured to college students. He appeared on Broadway, if only to pay all his lawyers who were taking his case to the Supreme Court. Joe Frazier even chipped in. We were in New York, Joe and I. Boondini Brown happened to see us pull up to the hotel and said they were having a problem with Ali's bill. I told Boondini, let me talk to Joe about it. Got Ali to get into the limo. I gave him a ride, put some love in his hand, okay, some money. <laughs> and I think it's like a couple of thousand dollars. Ali don't know, no, I put it in his shirt pocket. When Ali gets out of the car, it was like, a switch went on. He started, all right, Frazier, out the car now. I want you now. Joe Frazier, got my championship. I want to fight Joe Frazier. I'm going to whoop Joe Frazier. I'm going to show him who the real world champion is. And Joe's going, what's wrong with this guy? As if Muhammad Ali was not confusing Joe enough, he even moved to Joe's Philadelphia. Joe resented Ali winding up in Philadelphia. It was his city and his town, his crib, as he used to say. In the fall of 69, I received a call about a possible meeting between uh, Frazier and Muhammad Ali at one of our PAL centers. Joe knew he was coming. What was going to transpire, we didn't really know. Joe was now part of the plan to keep Ali's name in the public eye. We were trying to get the license back together again so we could face each other. So therefore, whatever agreement that he would call and say, let's do, I agree upon it. I looked up the street and uh, here came Muhammad Ali. I want Frazier. 
got to the point that people were on the radio. They were saying, there's a report, there's a crowd swelling at 22nd Columbia Avenue. Ali's down there. He's going to challenge Joe Frazier. They're going to fight. Uh, I'd say easily over a 1,000 people and still growing. I want Frazier. I want Frazier. Joe saw Muhammad. Joe, I want you. Joe replies, I want you too. But it was getting uh, heated. Ali challenges Joe. He says, I want you, we don't need to wait to meet you in Fairmount Park. Joe says he'll be there. Businesses shutting down in Center City, Philadelphia, so they couldn't miss this. Thinking it was just a publicity stunt he could ignore, Joe didn't show in Fairmount Park. But Ali did. Loudly. Ali is now, he's afraid I was going with him. You know, he's taking him through all that. This is unbelievable as to just how much the public wants this to happen, that they will bite for any little thing. To, they really thought they were going to fight in Fairmount Park. Uh, OK. Ali had made Joe look bad in his own town. But Joe was more concerned with his fight in February of 1970 with Jimmy Ellis, the WBA champ from the tournament Joe had previously boycotted. Ellis goes down from a murderous left hook to the jaw. And there's the bell. And he laid it. Fraser hugs manager Yank Durham as they share this precious moment. But as Joe celebrated being the undisputed world heavyweight champion, respect for the title was hard to come by, even right outside Madison Square Garden. But Muhammad Ali has not lost his title in the ring, hence this force which they're having inside can hardly be billed as a world heavyweight championship fight. We are very proud in Atlanta. We're very happy that we have given the champion the opportunity to come back into the ring. Georgia State Senator Leroy Johnson and Atlanta Mayor Sam Massale pulled the political strings to provide Muhammad Ali with a boxer's license and a comeback on October 26, 1970. His opponent, Jerry Quarry. Your champion of justice and peace and human dignity. Thank but not everyone in Georgia agreed. I'd rather see him fighting in Korea or Vietnam. They're going to let him be free, then it's his right to fight and make a living here. Otherwise, he shouldn't be free, and I don't think he should be free. I think it is a sad and tragic day that any man that refused to fight for his country would get in the ring and fight for dollars. Lester Maddox was totally against the fight. And he instigated a lot of people. People were showing up with axe handles, banging on doors and banging on cars. But the fight came off. After a three and a half year layoff, Ali stopped Quarry in the third round. Muhammad Ali and a sensational comeback victory. Quarry would be much harder to fight than Joe Frazier. Joe Frazier would be easy to hit. Relicensed in New York after a federal court order, Muhammad Ali then endured a 15-round battle with Argentina's Oscar Bonavina. I've always wondered whether it convinced Ali that he could do anything. Joe Frazier was a truth machine, and if you weren't in supreme condition, he would find it out. With an Ali Frazier showdown now possible, Madison Square Garden and the Houston Astrodome each offered a record payday, 1.25 million to each man. But Ali's manager, Herbert Muhammad, and Yank Durham wanted more and got it from a stranger. Well, I'd never promoted a fight before. I uh, sounded like a, a hell of an idea, and I thought it would be a huge event that would transcend boxing because it had to do with the Vietnam War and uh, religion and uh, uh, being black in America and all of that. As a high-powered Hollywood agent who represented Marlon Brando and Elizabeth Taylor, Jerry Parencio understood the marquee value and the price, 2.5 million for each fighter. I had just one problem, I didn't have the five million dollars. And the 77th man that I talked to was Jack Kent Cooke. He must be the loudest phone on earth, hello. Who owned the forum out here, and he had the Lakers and the Kings. Oh golly, I'd love, I'd, I'd be uh, deeply interested in going. Jack Kent Cook agreed to put up 4.5 million with the garden putting up the other half a million. Ringside seats would be a record $150. Ali's ballyhoo was free. Wait till I get you in the line. Wait, 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 wait. 
I was sitting right next to Joe Frazier. He was putting Joe down something awful, telling him how ugly he was, and Frazier was hard as a rock, and I could feel his muscles rippling as he was sitting there getting angrier and angrier. Finally, Frazier got up and he looked at Ali you know, glaringly, and he said, uh, I will be there. And he was. But the Garden would need a quick date for the fight. The sooner, the better. If Ali's appeal of his draft case as a conscientious objector to the Vietnam War was denied, he would go to prison, and the fight would go with him. The Muslims and Ali were convinced that he was going to go to jail in April. Absolutely convinced. They thought, let's get one more payday. The only March date that was open was March 8th of 1971, which turned out that it was not open. My manager called me up and said, uh, you know, there's an interesting wrinkle here. It seems as though uh, they're uh, promoting this fight on the same night that, uh, that we've uh, rented the joint. I absolutely thought I'd have a heart attack. But the James Taylor people were terrific. We called them, we met with them. My impression of it was that they sent down a legal team that was like uh, half legal and half rugby. You know, I mean, it was these people would not be denied. Like, like Ali himself, they would not be denied. We got our way out of it by giving them 15 pair of ringside tickets and a new date. They weren't great seats. Uh, they were on the balcony somewhere. But it was an amazing event. And you know, it was incredible to be there. In his training camp in Miami Beach, Ali was beating the publicity drums loud and clear. And sometimes it got insulting. You're going to see two heavyweight champions fighting. One is the phony and one is the real one. And it's going to be easy to distinguish who is the phony. Well, number one, he's too ugly to be the world heavyweight champion. <laughs> Everybody wants to know what's going to happen to Joe Frazier. And I all he came guys. back just as Muhammad Ali left. Brash, taunting, working the crowd, working the media, only as Muhammad Ali could. Look how scared I am. I'm be sticking on you. He knew Joe wasn't scared of him. So he had to find some buttons to push on Joe. I'm gonna stick. to get him out of his game. There was a lot of resentment on Ali's part as to what he had been through. And to Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier had become the symbol of his oppressors. A lot of them want me whooped because of the draft. A lot of them want me whooped because I'm black. In many ways, Joe lived the African-American experience to a much truer extent than Ali did. Joe was the son of a sharecropper. Joe was raised poor. He was not an orator. He was from the country, and you know, have a sudden draw, and you know, he was kind of the type of guy that you know, you live and let live. He got into a gym. He trained. You pointed him in the direction, and he went. That was it. He knew nothing about politics. Nothing about gamesmanship. We gonna find up Joe Frazier, and everybody with Joe Frazier. Right. Ali defined him in public as some kind of a white man's Negro, ass-kissing, Uncle Tomming, never stood up for anything except a purse in the ring. Plus, you're not a good-looking guy, and you're dumb. How do you feel, Chell? Die, 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 As Joe saw it, look, I'm just a fighter. Let's get in the ring and let's fight. He didn't understand all of these assets of showmanship that Ali brought to the fair and that Ali rained down upon Joe. I ain't bothering him. Don't he bother me. My, my, my mind is go. You know, why is this guy doing this? I mean, why do you have to say these things about me? Hey, I'm a Tom, you know what I mean? I'm a white man champ. That wasn't what it was all about. It was about being the champ for the world, representing everybody. It got very ugly. I asked one of his wives, what did Ali really think of Frazier? She said he thought that he didn't understand what was happening around him, and he thought truly that he was a pure nigger. I like Joe, and Joe and his innocence was representing white America. 
in his innocence. And that will incense a revolutionary who's trying to make change and no doggone well, there's no equality. But I think there's a cruelty in calling people certain kind of names. Better violin to die than to Uncle Tom and try making peace, making peace to live a lie. Yank Durham and myself is responsible for Clay to get a license. And after he got a little foothold, you know what I mean? He tried to do everything and say everything to put me down. The thing that really, I believe, hurt my dad was that he gave his heart, his soul, to help another brother. And then that brother comes back and then like a knife cuts him. Definitely I was a Tom. I was a Tom for him. So he get a, a license to fight again. I would get in all kind of trouble in school. The majority of the kids like, Ollie's going to whip your dad. You know, your dad can't fight. You know what I mean? Why you say that? Why you say my dad? Because well, he's the Tom. I'm like, what? Yeah, my dad ain't no Tom, you know? And in the black community, that's, that, those are harsh words. This is their dad. You know what I mean? And why are people being rude to them and cruel? So it built up an anger that he felt the only way to strike back was to get Ali in that ring and beat his ass. Ali's taunts could be cruel, racially cruel. That's what you are, uh, Uncle Tom. Earlier That's in his career, he had tormented both Ernie Terrell and Floyd Patterson. Call me Muhammad Ali, not Cassius Clay. This is what Muhammad Ali is saying for him the whole time. He actually punished those men in the ring because they refused to call him Muhammad Ali. So here was Joe Frazier, his next victim, so to speak. And the next one to ignore Ali's chosen name. What do you call Muhammad? Did you? Do you? No, when I, you? I call him Clay. You call him Clay? Yeah. He called me Tom. Called me the white man's champ. So therefore I said, Hey, Cassius. I'm gonna beat your butt. You call me a I know that would make you mad. Only those who were bigots, rednecks, hardliners continued to call him Clay, almost as an insult. And when Frazier chose to do that too, to a lot of African Americans, it was kind of like, hey, who are you siding with here? Take a look in the mirror. Adding meanness to an already mean situation took the fight beyond the ring to just about everybody in America. That's how Ali was selling the fight. Muhammad Ali was a big huckster, too. Joe Frazier's so scared he won't even weigh in with me. He won't even have a physical with me. He won't let nobody watch him train. He's scared to death. See, if you talk I'm... enough stuff long enough, right, you're going to get two things that are going to happen. Some people are gonna like you, and some people are gonna hate you. And if you work in the arena of boxing, like, where somebody actually can be paid to put his foot deep in your ass, then people will pay for that. The whole world tunes in from the name of Muhammad Ali's on the building. Frazier never understood why Ali thought he had to make fun of Joe to sell tickets. They were guaranteed the money, two and a half million each. They did not have to sell tickets. Ali was selling himself. He was also selling Joe Frazier short, and the media ate it up. In 1971, I wrote a cover story called Joe Frazier, a white champion in a black skin. It was wrong. It was absolutely wrong. But it was the way it was. As battles of the century go, this one is different. First, because both Ali and Frazier are champions and undefeated. Second, because no fight has ever had as heavy a show business side as this one, or depended as heavily on the art of electronics. For the closed circuit telecast, Jerry Parencio put together his announcing team. Old pro Don Dunphy is the blow-by-blow -blow announcer, and former champion Archie Moore is the analyst. The third voice was a surprise. Bert Lancaster, how you doing, Bert? <laughs> I'm doing this just because the promoter's a friend of mine and asked me if I would like to do it, and I thought it would be something interesting to do. This didn't make it a network broadcast. This made it something special. And here's Bert, you know, major Hollywood actor, major Hollywood star, box office draw. Ali, how are you, dear boy? I'm doing just fine, and I hope you're doing well. Because of Parencio's show business background, it was hard to separate where the reality hey, ended and, and showbiz came in. Well, listen to me. I'm going to hold you to Go it. Go ahead, Tom. I'm going to talk to you when I whoop you. This ringside seat has been brought to you by Vitalis. 
On the garden schedule, there were no ticket prices because all the tickets had already been sold. We could have sold out 10 Madison Square Gardens. I think the whole garden must have been actually sold to people who knew somebody. But for Cook and Parencio to be successful, a garden sellout wasn't enough. The closed circuit locations had to fill up too. And even with tickets at a new high of as much as $30, most locations did sell out. The news media also got into the act and bombarded the garden with over 2,000 requests for 600 credentials. Don't miss the last chapter, the heavyweight championship of the world, Monday night. Masses of our people are in the streets. They're fighting an eye for an eye and a life for a life. The rebellions that we see are merely dress rehearsals for the revolution that's to come. In March of 1971, there seemed to be the crossroads of feelings between Americans. I think it's very difficult for people in hindsight to understand how deep the divisions in America were. There was violence in the streets. I mean, there were hard hats beating the hell out of long hairs every day. The polarization of political attitudes began to cloak the fighters in those opinions. This color they call Clay or Muhammad Ali, whatever he wants to call himself, is a disgrace to the nation. Now here's a black man, and the Huggies gonna send him to Vietnam to fight for freedom. Tell them we're 100% behind Mr. Man. What you got was a tremendous polarization. Those who were rooting for Ali as the standard bearer for resistance to the draft, and those who were supporting Joe Fraser, not because he said we should be there, he didn't, but because he was the anti-Ali. He was one of them, and Ali was one of us. We weren't interested in the fairness of it all. There was no in the middle. It was actually fanatical. People would reach a height of frenzy. Us. Clay's the most popular man since Jesus Christ. Well, I think it'll be Frazier. I think he can whip it. I think he can take it. I think he can dish it out. Here's this collision between black militant and the black tom. Who's gonna win? That's what it was about. There was a, a war, a political war, separating the two fighters. Good guy, bad guy, bad black, good black. True blue American against the draft dodger. And people showed up there rooting as much for a political and moral position as they were rooting for the men. The men were, <laughs> by that time, almost incidental. All of this came to surround the fight, to confuse people that it was more than a fight. And as a result, captured the imagination of Americans everywhere. Monday, March 8th, the noon weigh-in. Frazier, 203 and a half. Ali, 215. They weighed in separately. Yank Durham did not want Joe to hear Ali's antics. Harry Markson told me, Ali's going to stay up in a press room. He's going to stay there all day, so we don't have any problem getting him back in the arena tonight. All he did was eat all day, the entourage, right? Send up another four steak sandwiches, or, you know, uh, get a case of beer up here, you know. They, they ran up a $4,000 bill. That afternoon, closed-circuit producer Neil Marshall was having a final run-through with his crew. Now you got 65 guys in the ring, and all of a sudden, you hear up in the rafters, Champ is in town. It's Ali. Ali is in the garden. I have a lot of speed. I have a lot of endurance. When I'm through with Frazier, he'll need more insurance. <laughs> it was like a show in the middle of the afternoon. It was great stuff. Away from the commotion in the garden, for security reasons, the New York State Athletic Commission had kept a secret. We as referees and judges all were just hoping for this choice assignment. At 6 p.m., Mercanti and the two judges, Artie Idala and Bill Recht, were informed they would be working. Ali and Fraser both received $2.5 million that night. And uh, the third man, handling the fight with all the responsibility, received $750. I probably would have done it for nothing. But this was much more than another big fight. This was a world event. The television picture would allow 300 million people to see the fight live. 2 million in the United States and Canada, 
298 million everywhere else. Ironically, this battle in the ring created some peace in the streets. I was in Belfast at the time, and I was really preoccupied with another fight. At that time, there was a tragic internecine feud going on between the breakaway Stalinist wing of the IRA and the provisional IRA. This was life and death time for people involved in the Republican struggle. And the feud ended as quickly as it began. And one of the reasons was that the Fraser Ali fight was coming on television and nobody was going to be out in the street gunning for somebody else when that fight was coming on. girlfriend was a model here and I walk up and a kid grabs my tickets and runs well right away my my street instincts took over and I jumped off the steps going up in, in the garden a few steps later I caught him grabbed him knocked him down to the ground and took back my tickets and this young woman she was like stunned that she was looking at me like are you a madman I said he took our tickets this is the been the great fights it was a bunch of us so uh raggedy ass, you know, <laughs> hippie looking, lost souls uh, sort of wandering into the thing saying, wow, man. The fashions were dazzling. It just had the look of a coronation more than a fist fight. It even appealed to those critical of fashion. Tons of color, tons of attitude, hot pants, revealing bust lines with lacing, mink, Florida by white coats, and those were the men. Men outdressed the women. Men were peacocks, they were dynamite. This was glamour, fabulous, outrageous looking clothing. Nothing I'm recommending. I've been in a lot of rooms in my life. I have never walked into an arena where the excitement in the air was absolutely, I mean, it was electricity. Just every movie star, you think that you think, oh my God, look at this. They're either sitting in the back of you or right in front of you. You're right with them. Just happened to turn around and I looked over at seat 50. There's old boys. And he's got a camera. During the national anthem, Frank Sinatra slipped into a ringside seat as a photographer for Life magazine. He was just one of the many celebrities in the garden that night. They can't spell fight. They've never seen a fight. They don't know what the hell they're watching, but they had to be there. Why? Not to see this fight. This was mandatory that they be there to be seen themselves. In the fighters' dressing rooms, the tension was building. I go to the Ali dressing room to tell the Ali camp, are you ready to exchange trainers? They're ready to wrap Joe. You ready? He gets up off the table and he said, what's, what's Frazier doing? I said, yeah, whatever I said. I'm like nervous, my heart. Boom, boom. I'm not, Joe, Joe can't take this. I just, then he was shuffled. Just, da, 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 da. Ba, 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 ba. Boom, he's out. Frazier's down. I all these Yeah, champ. Yeah, champ. That's right, champ. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. Let me get out of here. Joe Frazier's dressing room was as quiet as a church. In a way, it was. I said, Pop, what did you pray? Uh, he said, I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, uh, help me to, 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 to kill this man because he's not righteous. Now the truth has arrived. <laughs> Lights dim. Come in Ali first. Red trunks, red tassels, war, war. Coming in, second, bopping and booping as he does, Joe Fraser, brocaded green. And Joe Fraser, ladies and gentlemen. There seems to be a mingling of wounds along with the applause. I don't know why this man is a gallant champion. 
Let him see anything. Let him hear anything. Just him. Focus on him. Nobody else but him. For the first time in heavyweight championship history, we have two undefeated fighters in there. Ali is whipping around the ring and around Joe. And everybody thought, well, he's taunting Joe. He's doing his act. And Ali said later that he was just saying, two and a half million dollars. Can you believe it? Two and a half million dollars. I don't know if anybody heard the introductions. I imagine it was like the Roman Colosseum. Joe Frazier, 26-0. Muhammad Ali, 31-0, were together at last. For Frazier, it was the opportunity to silence the voice that had tortured him. For Ali, he was back where he belonged, waiting for the bell with the heavyweight championship at stake. completely frustrated. Almost came close to knocking him out the first round. Defying the sands of time, Ali quickly got the garden crowd on his side, winning the first two rounds on the official scorecards. But Frazier kept boring in. The idea was to get to the body shot, get by that jab. I didn't get through all of it. He lumped me up with some of it. That was going to be his style. He would take two to land one. He would take three to land one. But he would keep coming forward, get close enough to do damage with those short arms. I challenged him to the jab by moving and getting closer. Because I know if I just touch him one time with the left hook, he was going to know about it. The left hook was the punch Joe Frazier needed to land, but it had not landed yet. He put a weapon on Joe's head in those first three rounds. I thought Frazier may go, and then it began to turn. Now Frazier is scoring. He said he would go to the body, and he is. Muhammad Ali, flat on his feet, not up on his toes, like the Muhammad Ali of old. May have been told to move far. He's up on his toes for the first time tonight when he was tagged. Frazier would soon move ahead on the official scorecards. And he knew he was ahead. Frazier's just laughing at him, talking to him. That's the way Muhammad Ali used to taunt his opponent. And not only want to establish his physical superiority in way, he just wanted to punish him because he was bringing things into fight promotion that didn't belong in the fight promotion. Frazier was doing what he said he would do, taking the words out of Ali's mouth. I mean, this is a Joe Frazier who's apparently kept a lot of anger against Muhammad Ali in his heart. What a it was definitely a back and forth. I mean, Ali's skill was evident. I mean, he had a the ability to make Frazier look bad at times, but, but Frazier would keep coming forward. As part of most of Ali's fights, there was a prediction. This fight, according to Ali, would end in six. He said he was going to stop me in six. And I said, uh, six, you know what? Joe was the worker, never stopped working. Bang, bang, bang. And Ali would be putting his hands up, fooling around here. Those pity pat punches aren't going to do much for anybody. Ali gave away about three rounds because he had that pitta patter style and then motioning to the audience that he didn't hurt me, et cetera, et cetera. Ali will score no knockout in this round. I'm giving him help because he's playing with the guy. 
platinum and everything else. I, I told him, man, come on now. Get it together. Through eight rounds, the official scorecards had Frazier ahead, but not everyone agreed. Going into the ninth round, it was even. But the ninth round, I would put on a dazzling show. And Muhammad Ali comes back. He's got a great reserve. Suddenly, Ali found his second win, and you thought, my God, he's doing it again. Here he comes. It had ebbs and flows to the action. It was Ali, it was Fraser. It was Ali, it was Fraser. It was Ali, it was Fraser. I mean, that's what made it. Ali would win both the ninth and tenth rounds, but Joe refused to be denied. He said it to me a lot of times. Hey, man, I'm prepared to die in there because he felt his whole life his family all of what he stood for was on the line Joe trying to get that shot in there Ali Muhammad talks for him again he said don't you know I'm God I said God you're in the wrong place tonight I'm taking the and kicking ass in the 11th round Joe Frazier's anger exploded. He's holding on desperately. And he really had Ali in trouble. Muhammad Ali rocks him to the rope. He almost went down. For some reason, Joe did not follow up on it. Frazier wondered if Ali was playing possum, if Ali was faking the wobbling walk to draw him in. Joe remained cautious. The walking was too slow, but I was trained that you always got to remember a man is dangerous when he hurt. The round is over. The round is over. The round is over. What a round. He was really hurt, and that was from that plane around the corner. You know, the rope of dope, that was a little bit of the rope of dope, but he was the dope, so he got nailed. Frazier really clobbered him with everything in the book. I said, What's wrong with this guy? What's holding him up? At that point, you had the feeling that this fight was Fraser's period end of paragraph. That was it. Then miraculously, Ali comes back. Ali is putting all his power in those punches, and they've got to be hurting Joe. Best fight I've ever seen, perhaps be the best fight I'll ever see, and I better cherish this. Entering the final round, Frazier was well ahead on the official scorecards, but he did not know that. He was still looking to land that big left hook. Both close to exhaustion, and then Frazier unfurls this left hook. took down Muhammad Ali in that 15th round was Joe Frazier's revenge. He had persevered. This was Joe Frazier's defining moment. No one will ever forget what he and Muhammad Ali gave to the world on March 8th, I'm going to do whatever I can to get Muhammad Ali, even if I die. And that's what did it. So here we are in Madison Square Garden. The people are still standing around. Nobody seems to want to go home. I think everybody has been treated to one of the greatest fighting evenings they've ever seen. It was the most eagerly anticipated, closely watched event 
of my lifetime. These were two of the greatest fighters of all time, and they went at it for 15 rounds. The fight itself, viewed in a vacuum, was extraordinary. In the aftermath of an event that had touched so many, Jerry Parencio went to console the loser. He had no more left the ring than I headed down there too. He was sitting there, still had his trunks on, and there was this young black woman who was on the floor, and she had her arms around his calf. She was just crying, and you, you could see that she was emotionally uh, very, very upset. He took this woman's head and gently turned her around. He said, Diana, he said, say hello to the man that gave me two and a half million dollars to get my ass whooped. And it was Diana Ross. Mohammed is the greatest no, no. fighter that ever lived. He should be put down in history. Well, no, he's just a rope bender. All he was lay up against the ropes like nothing. he was in a cradle. You're no, Joe, you're not I'm saying nothing. I'm talking about a fighter. Joe Fraser's a fighter. People didn't leave the arena, I got to tell you, for 40, 50 minutes. They were still standing there going, wow, what a night, you know, what an ending, what a finish, you know. Now a report from Bill Walker at Madison Square Garden. Frazier emerged from the fight the undisputed champion, but he was a weary, battered victor after 15 punishing rounds. I want him to come to me and apologize for all the things he called me. Ali was not around for that apology. The man who said he could not be beaten didn't appear at the post-fight news conference. Doctors at a New York hospital were examining Ali's severely bruised jaw. The next day, Ali met with reporters. How's your jaw? I'm, I'm just so I, just, I don't have a mark on me, if you see. I don't have one scratch. I mean, nothing happened to me. All I have is this bruised uh, jaw here. Well, if you looked at the fight, of course, Ali had a swollen jaw, but Frazier had taken some tremendous punches, and his face was swollen. Did he ever hurt you? Well, I thought you were a couple times. You know, he's a big man. Any big man can hit. The rumor was he's dead. He died in the hospital. I got a call from Bud Schuberg, and Bud said, Gene, I just heard that Joe Frazier died. I said, oh my God, Ollie, Bud Schuberg said Joe Frazier died. And Ollie said, if he did, I'll never fight again. Joe Frazier was admitted to the Jufre Pavilion of St. Luke's Hospital this afternoon, suffering from extreme fatigue and high blood pressure. I went over to the hospital. It was, uh... It was very sad to go there. There was nobody there at all of them, and he was very close to death. Certainly didn't want Ali's camp to know that he had taken such a beating. Dr. James Dufresne, the medical director of St. Luke's, says Frazier's present condition is not related to that fight. I just thought there's a lot of people that made a lot of money out of this thing. Now it's over, he won, and uh, everybody was taking care of themselves. Frazier's blood pressure returned to normal and he left the hospital a week later. Most of those who cheered Joe were relieved. Others had already moved on. All those right-wingers and all those hard hats who were cheering the Vietnam War, who claimed to love Joe Frazier on March 8, 71, really didn't have much use for Joe Frazier on March 9, 71, aside from the fact that Joe might be able to whoop Ali's ass, and that they wanted. That's unfortunate. But the memory of the fight has endured. This was more than a boxing match. It meant so much to a lot of people. I cried my eyes out. I'm sure most people did. You were so certain that you were right to support Ali, that you were right to oppose the war, that the cause of civil rights was just. And when he lost, it was almost like, it can't be. I can't be on the wrong side of those things. I just can't be. You had the sense that the bad guys won. The wrong people won this fight. And, and what they represented had triumphed in the ring. But we knew that what they had represented was losing all over the country. The Supreme Court today overturned the draft of Asian conviction of former heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali. And as Ali's image and myth and name and reputation grew, Joe's was sure to suffer. The winner that night was the loser. The loser that night was the winner. The animosity the two fighters had toward each other never left. Ali continued to taunt Frazier, who continued to despise Ali.
And to add insult to injury, Joe would lose both the rematch at the Garden and the Thriller in Manila. As the years have passed for Joe, apparently time has not healed all the wounds. And ironically, he and Muhammad Ali have traded places in the war of words. And years, many years later, unfortunately, when, when Ali has Parkinson's syndrome and uh, is, is glazed and quivering, Frazier then says something really mean-spirited. Well, now you know who won those fights. Look at him today, look at me. I'm the one that's supposed to be dumb, duh, 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 but who's talking like that, you know? That all comes back from that Uncle Tom comment before the 1971 fight, and he's still carrying that hurt. I, I swallow a lot of razor blades, and sometimes they cut inside, you know? I would get wrong boxes and say some of the things that I shouldn't say. I've always thought that they brought out the best in each other in the ring and the worst in each other outside the ring. I want to, like, throw the towel in. And I'm willing to, like, you know, uh, say to Muhammad, you heard that? And let's say all the fans, all his family, if I've done anything wrong to him, Hey, man, forgive me. Like all the epic rivals in sports, Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali each needed the other to bring out the best in himself. And on that night of March 8, 1971, in the crucible of a tumultuous era, Ali emerged as the world's most recognizable personality. But it was Joe Frazier who had put him center stage. Two gladiators for the ages turned America into one nation divisible with Ali and Frazier for all.